Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, I see a bunch of new faces, so thank you for joining us. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce Giovanni Valente, who's based in the Politecnico di Milano, uh, the Department of Mathematics. I think you are the only philosopher there, if I'm not mistaken. In my department, yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, this is going to be the first of two meetings on this topic. Uh, the next week we're going to have Vincent Ardurel, which is there, uh, who wrote a reply to this very paper uh, that Giovanni is going to present. I hope Giovanni will join us to, uh, <laughs> to have time for counter replies. So as, as I understand it, this is based on a joint work, right, with uh, Joss uh, Uffink. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you again for accepting the invitation. Uh, the title of the talk is going to be Lansford Theorem and the Hero of Time, whenever you want. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Christian, for the kind introduction and uh, for the invitation. And thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. Um, as, as Christian mentioned, uh, uh, the content of my presentation today um, is part of a joint paper that I published back in 2015 uh, together with Yossi Fink. Um, and uh, um, it's a paper that uh, took a while to us to complete and then uh, uh, as I said, I haven't, uh, I haven't worked on, on the topic for the past three or four years, but I know that Vin Sang was in, in the audience, uh, uh, you know, published a reply to it. And uh, that gave me also an opportunity to think more about, about this issue. And then uh, you, you will have a chance to hear um, what Vin, Vin Sang has to say um, in reply to our own uh, analysis of Lenford's theorem uh, in a week or so. Um, so just to stress the importance of uh, uh, Lenford's theorem, let me begin by oops, op resorting to uh, authority. So this is a quotation uh, from Cédric Villani, who claimed that uh, le théorème de Lenford est, est peut-être le plus important résultat mathématique de la théorie cinétique. Um, and, uh, I actually agree, it's a very important uh, result with some technical limitation, but it, it's conceptually very, very uh, crucial for the development of uh, kinetic theory. Um, it does, however, raise some important questions, uh, philosophical questions, especially as regards uh, the era of time and the emergence of uh, irreversibility. And that's exactly the, the, the issue on which Yossi Fink and I uh, focused uh, when, uh, when writing this paper. Um, let me show you this picture. You're all familiar with the problem of irreversibility and how it is connected with the error time. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide, but uh, you, know, you might think uh, of a, gas uh, contained in a vessel and uh, in the upper part of the picture you see a spontaneous expansion of this gas first at time t equal to zero being uh, confined in the left half of the vessel uh, and then if it is left free to expand it will eventually at a subsequent time t greater than zero occupy uh, all the volume available uh, that's what we observe. Um, this is what our macroscopic observations suggest. We never observe, however, the reverse process, namely the gas being uh, spread in all possible, in all the available volume, uh, spontaneously contracting to uh, one half uh, of the of the basin. Uh, the first process, the one being observed is usually is accompanied by an increase of entropy and thermodynamics the, you know, can describe or account for this phenomena. In the, the, the second process, the spontaneous construction, uh, contraction of the gas uh, would be accompanied by an, uh, a decrease of entropy, but 
as I said, we never, we never really observed this phenomenon. The question underlying the kinetic theory of gases and all the work in, on statistical, in statistical physics is how to provide a microscopic uh, justification, microscopic explanation for um, this phenomenon, in particular uh, the second law of, of thermodynamics that predicts this uh, one-way increase of entropy uh, is often thought of as, uh, you know, underlying the error of time. So uh, real processes occur in one direction of time, but not in the opposite. And so the hope is to be able to provide an underpinning of this uh, uh, orientation of time as being, uh, um, you know, uh, as following the thermodynamic era of time uh, from a microscopic uh, point of view. And uh, uh, the power of lamp 4 uh, theorem is that it proves under very precise uh, conditions, although with some severe uh, technical restrictions as well, um, that the macroscopic Boltzmann equation uh, can be uh, rigorously derived from the microscopic dynamics dictated by the Hamiltonian equations of motion uh, if one uh, works in the so-called uh, Boltzmann graph limit. And uh, so, allegedly, the theorem derives a, uh, an irreversible result, namely the Boltzmann equation, from uh, time reversal uh, invariant dynamics given by the Hamiltonian equations of motion, at least for a very short but not negligible amount uh, of time. Now, the problem is that the Hamiltonian equations of motions are time reversal invariant, whereas the Boltzmann equation is not. And so the question to be asked is, where does the irreversibility of the Boltzmann equation come from? It certainly can't uh, be derived directly from the Hamiltonian equations of motion. And so in order to answer this question, one needs to identify some time asymmetric ingredient that somewhere in the theorem uh, is added to the Hamiltonian equation of motion in order to derive the macroscopic irreversible result. And uh, there's a huge discussion in philosophy of uh, thermal physics about the notion of uh, irreversibility. Clearly here, I take irreversibility to be equivalent to the uh, notion of time reversal non invariance. And uh, so uh, let me therefore fix the terminology here before, uh, uh, you know, starting the, uh, the, the analysis, the analysis of the theorem. Um, we take an equation to be time reversal invariant just in case for any solution of the equation, the time reversal transformation of this solution is also a solution of the very same equation. So if we consider an evolution equation uh, for a given function of time, uh, let's say ft, um, um, then, and we take the class S of allowed solutions for this evolution equation, then each solution corresponds to a possible history, a possible trajectory in time. Uh, the time reversal of this equation uh, is obtained by applying a transformation that flips the sign of time and also the sign of uh, momenta if the function ft depends on momenta too. Of course, by flipping the time, the sign of the time, you will automatically flip uh, the sign of momenta because momenta is given by the derivative of position over time. And so we will obtain as a time reversal of the solution ft, a solution f minus t. Uh, and so, 
each solution is also associated with the time reverse history, uh, say TH. The criterion for time reversal invariance um, demands that uh, if the equation for F um, uh, T uh, uh, is, oh, sorry. The criterion for time reversal invariance demands that uh, the equation for FT is time reversal invariant just in case um, TH, so the time reverse history, belongs to the class of allowed solution whenever H, the original history, belongs to the very same class of allowed solutions. Of course, uh, an equation would be time reversal non invariant if it fails to satisfy this criterion. Uh, okay, so having given an informal, for first informal presentation on the theorem, and having fixed uh, the idea of irreversibility as time reversal non invariance, let me uh, present the structure of the talk. Uh, so we'll first be, uh, introduce the R spheres model within which the Boltzmann equation is defined. Uh, I will recall Boltzmann's own uh, heuristic argument uh, for the derivation of the Boltzmann equation and the ensuing uh, H theorem. And I will pinpoint some of the well-known limitations of Boltzmann's argument. Uh, they will then provide uh, the first step, an informal characterization of the content of Lenfos theorem, uh, stressing that it provides a statistical H theorem that enables one to overcome some of the limitations of Boltzmann's original argument. And then I will go more formal, uh, providing the complete statements, uh, statement of Lenfors theorem and explaining the technicalities behind uh, this statement. Uh, in particular, I will stress that uh, Lenfors theorem provides in the Boltzmann grad limit a connection between the so-called Boltzmann hierarchy and the BDJKY hierarchy. And finally, we will have all the details at the uh, in order to tackle the main philosophical problem, the one concerning the emergence of irreversibility, if any, in the theorem. Okay, here's the R sphere model. In the R sphere model, all the molecules of a gas are idealized as uh, R spheres of diameter A and equal mass. So the gas is, is uh, enclosed in a, in a vessel. So it will have a final volume occupying the special region, uh, a final special region. Uh, there will be N molecules, a very large number of molecules of so hard spheres in the gas that are allowed to interact with each other only by means of binary collisions. And as it is well known, we can provide two descriptions of this, uh, um, of this gas uh, at the microscopic level, at the macroscopic level, at the microscopic, the microscopic state is given by a point in the six n dimensional uh, phase space. And these points evolve in accordance to the Hamiltonian equations of motion. At the macroscopic uh, level, instead, instead the state of the gas is given by a normalized distribution function, Ft, which is a function of uh, uh, position and momentum of the one particle uh, um, on the one of one particle, and it is defined, in fact, on the mu space, the one particle uh, mu space, and the evolution of the distrib distribution function is dictated by the Boltzmann equation. Of course, these are two dis descriptions at different levels of the same system, and so uh, one would expect them to be fully compatible. Again, this is the hope and the main challenge of uh, uh, statistical physics is to demonstrate that there is such a compatibility between the macroscopic uh, description 
uh, which agrees with our observations, the microscopic description of the very same phenomena, thermal phenomena. Uh, as I said, particles are uh, allowed to interact with each other only by means of binary conditions, uh, binary collisions. So let's zoom into the collision process because it's important in order to understand how the Boltzmann equation is constructed. Here we have our two particles, one and two, with incoming momenta P1 and P2 respectively. Uh, the centers so of once a collision happens, you know, the center of the two particles uh, are um, sort of connected by this uh, vector, the unique vector um, omega one, two, directed from the center of particle one to the center of particle two, times the diameter of the particles, and the incoming momenta are represented by P1 prime and P2 prime. The condition that omega times P1 minus P2 is greater or equal than zero indicates that the particles are actually approaching each other. So they are about to collide. If the sign of omega times P1 minus P2 is less than zero, then that means that the particles have collided. So they're no more approaching each other, but they are uh, getting far apart from each other. Uh, and we can also uh, express the outgoing momenta as function of the incoming momenta, again by using the uh, unit vector omega one two. Okay. Um, okay. The Boltzmann equation is uh, the uh, differential equation that enables us to uh, describe the way in which the macroscopic state evolves in the course, course of time. So I will tell you how the function Ft changes in the course of time. And uh, as it is written down in the uh, right side of this equation, such an evolution will depend on two elements. A free flow operator, okay, the Lumbil operator, uh, which describes the way in which the particle changes by the free evolution. So the, the, so, sorry, the one particle distribution function changes due to the free flow of the particles and a collision operator whose expression is a bit more involved. And uh, I highlighted here in red the crucial elements of the collision operators on which we need to focus in order to better understand the argument that we will present later on. So in front of the integral, there is a coefficient which depends on the number of particle n and the square of the diameter of the particles. And then um, uh, you can if you want for now, just for to simplify the understanding of the material uh, bracket, this term here and focus on the last one. And the last one, uh, the last term in red uh, is the difference between the product of uh, the distribution functions of particle one and two as they depend on the outgoing momenta and the product of the distribution function of the two particles as they depend on the incoming momenta. Okay. Just a second. While you contemplate uh, the formula. Okay. Now, uh, a crucial assumption in Boltzmann's original argument is the so-called uh, Stolz Salansatz, or assumption about the number of collision. So, in order to get to this expression, uh, Boltzmann had to introduce various assumptions, and this is this is actually the crucial one. And the Stolz Salansatz implies that a factorization condition, which tells us that the two particle distribution function factorizes, or is given by the product. Uh, distribution functions to the two particles 
and this indicates that particles are uncorrelated. So the meaning of the factorization condition is the absence of correlations between the two particles. But the Stolzan sats tells us something more, requires something more, namely that this factorization condition holds only for pre-collision and not for post-collision particles. In other words, factorization or the particles are uncor uncorrelated only before they collide with each other and not afterwards. From the Boltzmann equation, uh, Boltzmann derived the H. Giovanni, can I yeah? do you yeah. take a question? This is not a genericity condition, right? This is very spe special condition. I mean, most, most distribution would not have this form. Is that, that right? So exactly. it's just make, exactly. it, make a very specific assumption about the past here. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And, that's, and that's a crucial point. And in fact, Thanks. Um, l l Okay, let me get, get back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, uh, sure. Next slide, just, and then just, over just... and over again. But you're right. Yes, it's a very stringent condition, but necessary to derive the Boltzmann equation, at least in Boltzmann's original argument, nevertheless. And um, having uh, constructed the Boltzmann equation, uh, Boltzmann was able, uh, and let me re emphasize that the construction was mostly heuristic. Uh, then Boltzmann was able to derive this time more rigorously a theorem known as the H theorem, um, which tells us that if Ft is a solution of the Boltzmann equation, then the entropy of the system being associated with the negative of the H function, uh, whence the name H theorem, will increase monotonically until the system reaches equilibrium. So it reaches the uh, uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, okay? Okay, so for every solution, so the Boltzmann equation, we have an increase of entropy, exactly as it will be demanded if we want, if we want to capture the spontaneous evolution of a gas that in, according to the second law of thermodynamics uh, is accompanied by an increase of entropy rather than an increase. Of entropy. Um, so, of course, the reversible behavior of the, X, of the H function, the fact that it's the negative or its derivative uh, is uh, greater or equal than zero rather than less or equal than zero, is due to the fact that the Boltzmann equation is time reversal non invariant. And and here I come to the come back to the question that that, that that Carlo asked before. Actually, it was recognized that the time asymmetric ingredient in the Boltzmann equation is exactly the fact that the Stolzer and Satz holds only for pre-collision particles and not for post-collision particles. If in fact, if we were to assume factorization for post-collisions rather than pre-collision particles. What we would obtain is an equation that has the very same form of the Boltzmann equation. Um, so it has the Liouville operator, the free flow operator, and a collision term, but the sign of the collision term is negative. And this is actually the anti-Boltzmann equation, which turns out to be the time reversal transformation of the Boltzmann equation. And if we try to apply the H theorem to the anti-Boltzmann equation, rather than having an increase of entropy, we will have a decrease of entropy. Uh, there are some well-known limitations with Boltzmann's original argument. Uh, first of all, that his construction wasn't rigorous. It was uh, merely Heuristic, he never provided a full rigorous derivation of his equation. The problem of the existence and also the uniqueness of solutions of the Boltzmann equations, given very general initial conditions, remained open. And also, famously, uh, two objections were raised against the H theorem, namely the reversibility objection and the recurs recurrence objection that would indicate that sometimes entropy or actually the H function could decrease rather than increasing, um, or at least 
uh, according to these objections, uh, the H theorem would not be true in general, but only for some initial uh, possible microstates. And I will return to the reversibility objection and also to the recurrence objection in the discussion um, of uh, Lenford's theorem, rather than spending more time here. Uh, but the, the point is that more than 20 years after Boltzmann groundbreaking work on the derivation of the Boltzmann equation, the status of this equation and the status of the H theorem, especially due to the reversibility and the recurrence objection was uh, uh, still controversial. And in fact, Karkevel in 1894, inaugurated a famous debate in nature with a provocative question, namely, will anyone say exactly what the H theorem proves? Because even more than 20 years after Boltzmann, we were still unclear about the actual status of this, of this result. Now, Harald Grad, Grad uh, conjectured that one of the problems connected with, the, with Boltzmann's original argument, namely the fact that the derivation was just heuristic, could be solved uh, by trying to derive the equation uh, uh, in a suitable limiting regime. That is this conjecture was actually proposed by uh, Boltzmann himself. Uh, and in fact, the limiting regime of interest takes the name of Boltzmann graph limit that and demands that we need to let the number of particles go to infinity while uh, letting the diameter of the particles close to zero in such a way that the factor n times a square remains finite and on zero. And if you remember, n times a square is exactly the uh, coefficient in front of the integral in the uh, Boltzmann equation, or in the collision term of the Boltzmann equation. Um, so assuming this, the Boltzmann graph limit uh, guarantees that the collision term doesn't become uh, trivially zero. And, uh, and then Grad conjecture that if we take, if we work in this limiting regime, then the following construction could be made exact. Namely, we, if, if the time t is zero, we take the initial microstate x zero and we construct uh, a distribution, a one particle distribution x zero in the Boltzmann graph limit. Then as x zero evolves at a later time into xt according to the Hamiltonian equations of motion. And we, from this xt, we construct a one particle distribution function. There is this resulting one particle distribution function will correspond to the evolution of the initial distribution according to the Boltzmann equation. And the merit of Lenford was to uh, show that this intuition was actually correct and could be made, could be, could be made rigorous. In fact, he was able to provide a rigorous derivation of the Boltzmann equation from the Hamiltonian equations of motion, thereby establishing the existence of a unique solution for the Boltzmann equation, at least for um, a very short amount of interval of time. Um, the content of the uh, theorem proven by Lenford um, can be summarized in a informal way in measured theoretic terms. The theorem in fact shows that under precise assumption that we're going to, to survey uh, uh, in a little bit, almost all the initial microstate x0 that satisfy the initial condition uh, evolve according to the Hamiltonian dynamics uh, in such a way to agree with the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so this construction 
holds true for almost all initial microstates. And then as a corollary, just as Boltzmann did, Lenford was able to show a statistical H theorem, namely that for any solution of the dust constructed uh, Boltzmann equation, we can obtain a monotonic increase of entropy, namely the minus H, X, minus H function, uh, at least for almost all initial points. So the advantage of this uh, derivation um, that makes precise and rigorous the uh, original heuristic argument of, uh, uh, by Boltzmann is that it enables us to avoid the recurrence objection. The recurrence objection tells us that no matter what the initial state of the system, if the system is, uh, uh, you know, uh, containing a bounded volume, then uh, it will at a, eventually, no matter how it evolves, return arbitrarily close to the initial state. So if the, in this evolution, at some point, entropy increases, eventually we'll have to decrease, thereby contradicting the H theorem. Now, the fact that we adopt uh, the Boltzmann grad limit, whereby N grows to infinity, means that the volume of the phase space uh, of interest is unbounded. And therefore, Poincare's theorem on which the recurrence projection is based does not apply anymore. The theorem actually enables one to avoid also the reversibility objection by blocking the construction of um, Lodzmit type counterexample. Lodzmit is the physicist that uh, originally proposed the uh, reversibility objection. To see how that happens, we need to have the full statement of the theorem. So uh, trust me for the moment. Uh, and then uh, about this, this last point, the fact that we can avoid the reversibility objection, hold your breath and uh, stay with me in for the next 20 minutes or so, and then we'll see uh, how that can be done. Uh, but certainly we can avoid, and that's very, I think, intuitive at this point, we can avoid the recurrence objection just by taking, by taking a, a limit in which the number of particles grows to infinity, and so the volume of phase space becomes unbounded. Now, um, as I promised at the beginning of the talk, we can now move on to the more formal um, characterization of the theorem and the uh, full derivation of Lenford's theorem is actually given within the so-called BBJKY approach, whereby the macroscopic description of the gas system is given by a sequence of uh, multi-particle probability distribution. They actually reduce probability distributions that are indexed by uh, the label K that indicates the number of particles that we are considering. And there are actually two uh, hierarchies that now I'm going to introduce. Uh, the so-called Boltzmann hierarchy that proves to be equivalent to the Boltzmann equation provided that a certain factorization condition akin to the one adopted by Boltzmann for the two particle distribution function holds. And the uh, so-called BBJKY hierarchy that is probably equivalent to the Hamiltonian equations of motion. So in order to derive the Boltzmann equation from the Hamiltonian equations of motion, what one ought to show and what in fact Lenford did uh, is that under precise assumption, the BBJKY reduces to the Boltzmann equation, the, sorry, the Boltzmann hierarchy in the Boltzmann grad limit. And then the Boltzmann equation can be recovered by introducing uh, a factorization condition at a subsequent step. Okay, so we have two new animals here to deal with, the Boltzmann hierarchy and the BBJKY hierarchy. So let's look at what they are more in detail in order than to be able to, to grasp 
the formal statement length for Steven. The Boltzmann hierarchy um, is a hierarchy of evolution equations uh, depending on uh, the level K, indicating, as I said before, the number of particles that is constructed uh, again by appealing to a free flow operator and a collision operator. And uh, one can show that if FKT um, is a solution of the Boltzmann hierarchy that factorizes according to this factorization, generalized factorization condition. So FT, namely the one particle distribution function uh, over which FKT factorizes is a solution of the Boltzmann hierarchy. So the Boltzmann, uh, the Boltzmann equation, sorry. So the Boltzmann hierarchy is equivalent to the Boltzmann equation modulo, the, uh, well, if we add this factorization condition, okay? Now to make things more explicit, and all we need to do is to focus on the case in which K is equal to one because that's the case of interest in order to then derive the Boltzmann equation. Here, the free flow operator, the Liouville operator takes this form, the familiar form, which is exactly the same as the Boltzmann, as in the Boltzmann equation. And the collision operator takes this form, okay? Again, what interest us is the last term in red, and just compare it to uh, and uh, to, to determine the Boltzmann equation. If we apply a factorization condition to F two, okay, we obtain exactly this last term, which is the one appearing in the Boltzmann equation. So that's that illustrates the sense in which the Boltzmann hierarchy uh, is equivalent to uh, the Boltzmann equation once a factorization condition is applied. What about the BBJKY hierarchy? It's again a hierarchy of evolution equations, this time applied to a different distribution function, rho, which is assumed to be absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. But each term in this sequence, again labeled by k, the number of particles, uh, has a similar structure, uh, at least prima facie, uh, as the Boltzmann equation, the Boltzmann hierarchy. There's a free flow term and there's a collision term. To uh, appreciate things more, let's uh, more explicitly, let's again fix k equal to one. The Liouville operator is exactly as before. The collision operator instead has this form, which doesn't quite look like the Boltzmann equation. In fact, there are remarkable differences and more work is needed in order to connect the BBJKY hierarchy with the Boltzmann uh, hierarchy in the Boltzmann equation. So recall this is the Boltzmann collision term. A first difference is that the integral in the BBJKY hierarchy is taking over the entire uh, sphere. Whereas in the Boltzmann collision term is taking in the hemisphere of the particles that are about to collide. And then the last term looks like pretty different than the, uh, you know, the Boltzmann term, the last term in the uh, collision term for the BBJKY hierarchy. And notice one important fact that's conceptually meaningful, the fact that the two particles uh, are colliding and they are hard sphere with a non-zero um, diameter means that their center cannot occupy the same point in space. And in fact, in the BBJKY hierarchy, 
okay? If Q1 is the position of the first particle, Q1 plus A omega will be the position of the second particle, so the position Q2. Okay. That's a subtlety that is not taken into account in the construction of the Boltzmann equation. But it's an important subtlety nevertheless, because uh, if we want to describe a real gas systems, particles uh, have non-zero diameters, and so they occupy the same, uh, they can't occupy the same position in space. In fact, um, that's something that Lenford himself noticed, and he pointed out the, uh, the dynamics of the system is actually discontinuous at a point in which a collision, a collision takes place. In fact, also the pre-collision coordinate, X pre, uh, is a different point than the post-collision coordinate, X post even if we uh, you know, were to take Q1 and Q2 to be the same point. That's because the, uh, the pre-collision coordinate is um, you know, displaced in coming momenta and the post-collision coordinate outgoing momenta. So P momenta in the first case, P prime momenta in the other case. So, once a collision happens, we basically jump discontinuously from X pre to X post. So the dynamics is discontinuous. Uh, and in order to avoid this problem, we to make the dynamics smooth, we need to introduce a topology in which the pre-collision, the post-collision coordinate can be connected without discontinuity. And what Lamford did uh, in order to achieve uh, this goal was simply to identify the two collisions configurations. And so we have two possible uh, representations that we can adopt here. The incoming representation in which all momenta are written as incoming momenta and the, and the outgoing representation in which all momenta are written as outgoing momenta. And then length for, and so suggests that we need to adopt the incoming representation in order to make the BBJKY collision operator more alike to the um, Boltzmann collision operator. Okay? And in fact, by adopting the incoming representation for collision points, uh, and after a few technical manipulations that we need to, we don't need to go through now, was able to transform this integral over the entire uh, sphere into an integral over uh, the um, pre-collision hemisphere. And the term in red here inside the integral could be split in two parts one depending of uh, outgoing momenta, one depending on outgoing momenta. And notice that here, again, the position of the single particle depends on, uh, or, or is distinct from the position of the first particle by the quantity A omega. And of course, this term looks like the uh, Boltzmann collision operator much more than the previous one. Uh, and uh, okay, he has a picture of, uh, of uh, uh, the incoming versus outgoing momenta that explains also why here we have a sinus min minus, uh, here a, sin a minus plus, simply because, um, you know, um, omega, will point in the first case, in the case of incoming at momenta from the center of particle one to the center of particle two, whereas uh, in the case of outgoing momenta from the center of particle two to the center of particle one. Okay, this is again the BBJKY collision operator I showed you before. 
as it is written in the incoming representation, and let me stress this fact, and compare it with the Boltzmann collision operator that we saw before, uh, we have uh, pretty much the same term, with just one difference, that in the BBJKY collision operator, we have a dependence on the diameter of the particles. But if we take the Boltzmann grad limit, not only n goes to, goes to infinity, but also the diameter of the particle will go to infinity in such a way, of course, that n a square remains finite. But if we let a goes to zero, then you would expect the BBJKY collision operator to reduce to the Boltzmann collision operator. Um, so, what, what uh, Lamford managed to do following this intuition was exactly to derive the BBJKY hierarchy, uh, sorry, to derive from the BBJKY hierarchy the Boltzmann hierarchy. Okay, the, the free flow operator is the same as we saw the collision operator of the former will approach the collision operator of the latter if we take a, we let a go to, to zero as uh, demanded by the Boltzmann grad limit. So the derivation can be completed if the argument of the BBJKY hierarchy, so rho, the distribution, probability distribution rho, goes to the uh, Boltzmann distribution function f in the Boltzmann grad limit. And that's the real difficulty. The technical difficulty is, difficulty is to prove this fact. So under what conditions can convergence be proven? And uh, first of all, notice that convergence can be expected only on the set of points that have not yet collided. Um, and so we can demand uh, convergence only with this, this limited chunk of phase space. So away from some exceptional points in which particles are colliding. Uh, and uh, the convergence is understood in this sense as uh, um, in the Boltzmann grad limit we can just not to complicate further the discussion, skip the sense in which we take this limit, but not it, so it's essentially supremo, uh, the absolute value, the difference between the two distribution for each K. Uh, but notice, and that's important, that uh, this convergence ought to be guaranteed within this uh, set. Okay, of points for which the particles have not yet collided. Um, and this fact guarantees that we have convergence, convergence, convergence almost surely with respect to any measure, which is absolutely continued as regards the, or with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Um, okay, let's skip this part because it's complicated and let's come to the actual assumptions uh, of the theorem under which uh, Lenford was able to prove the sort after convergence. The first one, which I call reg regularity assumption, uh, is a condition on the uh, initial distribution row. It demands that this distribution is uh, um, uh, bounded um, and um, by the product of the density Z of uh, the gas and the Maxwellian distributions defined for momenta at the inverse temperature beta. This is a condition that uh, prevents, it is introduced in order to prevent uh, the initial distribution to building strong correlations. 
uh, and makes improbable that the particles uh, um, pick up very high energy. The second condition of the theorem is more intuitive, namely uh, it's the demand that uh, the initial distribution of the BBJKY hierarchy converges, converges in the limit, uh, the Boltzmann graph limit to the initial distribution of uh, the Boltzmann hierarchy. And this convergence is demanded within uh, the set of allowed points uh, that exclude points that are um, that you know, have not yet uh, collided. Given these two assumptions, the regularity condition and the convergence at time zero, Lenford was able to prove that there exists a strict positive time tau such that for any choice of k in the Boltzmann grad limit, the distribution being the solution of the, Bolt, the BBJKY hierarchy at time t converges, converges to the Boltzmann distribution at time t over, of course, the set of allowed uh, um, phase points. Okay. And notice that in the case of the convergence assumption, the set of allowed, allowed points uh, is ga oops, gamma uh, um, S and here is gamma S plus T, where T plus T, where T goes from zero to the time bound tau with a validity of the theorem. Uh, so out of the technicalities, the theorem tells us that in the Boltzmann graph limit, solution of the BBJKY hierarchy converge to solutions of the Boltzmann hierarchy during uh, a given interval of time. Moreover, uh, if at time t0, we assume if the generalized factorization condition we saw before, then uh, the time evolution of uh, uh, the initial one particle distribution is also a unique solution of the Boltzmann equation for the time lapse of validity of the theorem. In fact, and that's a result known propagation of cows, if the factorization condition holds at the initial time, it will hold continuously through time. And if we had introduced this factorization condition, then the Boltzmann hierarchy becomes equivalent to the Boltzmann equation. And so given that the Hamiltonian equations of motion are equivalent to the Boltzmann equation, to the BBJKY hierarchy, sorry. And from the BBJKY hierarchy, we were able to derive the Boltzmann hierarchy. Then we completed in this way, uh, Lenfors attempt to provide a rigorous derivation of the Boltzmann equation from the Hamiltonian equations of motion. Um, we can give a measure theoretic interpretation of the theorem, um, namely that given suitable initial conditions, we have convergence uh, everywhere except for the points in the set gamma S plus T. And notice that the size of exceptional points increases in the course of time. So the more uh, time passes and the more exceptional points we will have, namely points in which convergence uh, uh, doesn't hold. However, these exceptional points always have a size of measure zero. And so they can be neglected. So that's the measure theoretic interpretation of Lenfors result. A very powerful result indeed, but with very strong uh, limitations. First of all, uh, there is the well-known issues of how to justify the a priori measure. Here, the Lebesgue measure is simply assumed. 
uh, but a justification is needed for its privileged role. We have quite restrictive initial conditions, so the regularity assumption, so that row zero is bounded by the Maxwellian distribution, rules out a large class of initial probability distribution. The theorem is proven under the Boltzmann grad limit, and which introduces a very severe idealization because uh, it implies that the density of the gas goes to infinity. So the number of particles increases, but it, their diameter shrinks to zero. So density goes to zero, which means that the theorem might apply only to very diluted gases. In fact, infinitely diluted gases. And last but not least, uh, the time scale of the, of the validity of the theorem is of the order of one fifth of the mean free time. So the time that elapses between two collisions, which is typically a few milliseconds. So it's an extremely short time scale. Now it is believed and also Villani in the paper uh, from which I took the quotation at the beginning of the, the talk uh, so he believes and insists, like uh, most of the mathematical physicists working on the topic, that it's merely a technical problem that we haven't been able to prove a uh, length for theorem for longer times. Um, in fact, there is no known no go result against the time extension of the theorem. And most importantly, at least for our purposes that are philosophical purposes, this time bound, although extremely short, is still sufficient in order to uh, observe irreversibility. In fact, within this time bound, we do have an increase, a monotonic increase of the entropy of the system. And so you come the philosophical part, more, the more philosophical part of the, of the talk. So how do we answer the question about this, you know, what is the source of irreversibility in Lenford theorem? Now, Lenford claims uh, that his result shows unambiguously, as the quotation goes, that there is no contradiction between the reversibility of molecular dynamics and the irreversibility imply by the H theorem. However, of course, things are not that simple because we still need to identify the time uh, irreversible, the time reversal non invariant ingredient that is needed um, in order to derive the Boltzmann equation, the reversible Boltzmann equation by the time reversal invariant. Hamiltonian dynamics. Now, as I mentioned to you, an advantage of Lenford theorem compared to Boltzmann original argument is that it enables one to overcome Loschmidt reversibility objection. And it's worth to look at the argument in this respect without before um, trying to understand where irreversibility really comes from, if it comes from anything. Uh, now recall that in Loschmidt reversibility objection, if we let uh, the system evolve for some positive time, so the distribution, the one particle distribution function Ft will evolve according to the Boltzmann equation, with an increase of entropy. Uh, and then if we suddenly reverse all velocities of the particles, in principle, given that the H function is invariant under velocity reversal, the system will go back to the original state. But that means that there is some possible distribution for which the minus H function, so the entropy, decreases rather than increases, increasing. Um, and that's uh, that together with the recurrence objection is one of the main uh, objections to uh, Boltzmann's original argument. Now, 
Herbert Spong and Leibovitch um, pointed out the Lenford theorem, contrary to Boltzmann's original argument, uh, as the resources to block the reversibility objection. In fact, remember that uh, the theorem always requires that convergence is proven within a certain uh, set of allowed phase points. So if we let rho k evolve for some time uh, within the time bound of the of Lenford's theorem, then convergence of the BBJKY hierarchy to the Boltzmann hierarchy is ass assured over the set of uh, allowed states. Um, so gamma s plus t, then if we reverse all velocity as demanded by Loschmidt's argument, uh, then Lenford theorem can apply again at the new initial time, uh, but as assumption through in the theorem uh, requires, uh, this convergence at the initial time will have to be required for the all initial domain, gamma s. But um, of course, the uh, former, or, um, sorry, uh, but, but of course, gamma s uh, is uh, uh, greater then gamma st, because remember that the set of uh, uh, exceptional states increases in the course of time. And so we can't really apply the second step of Lojmit's argument in a meaningful way. And so Spong and Lebovich pointed out that we have a way to block the reversibility time objection. But then the question is, of course, where does the reversibility to the Boltzmann equation comes from? One thing is to block the reversibility objection. Another is to explain the uh, nature of the Boltzmann equation, which is an irreversible macroscopic evolution equation. And various views have been uh, proposed in the literature that are mutually incompatible on the source of irreversibility of Lenford's theorem. Lenford himself argued that irreversibility is introduced by the incoming representation for collision points. And this preference over the outgoing representation is just a matter of convention. Cercignani and other collaborators agreed on the privileged role of the incoming representation, uh, but they maintained control and for that it's not a matter of convention, or mere conventional choice, but rather this privileged role as a dynamical justification. Spong and Lebovich, by developing the argument that we just saw, pinned down a time asymmetric initial condition in the second assumption of the theorem. So there are, there is a variety of uh, proposals on the literature are quite diverse. So somewhat in analogy with Boltzmann original uh, H theorem and the debate in nature, we can ask, will, never, will anyone say exactly what Lenford theorem really says? And we claim actually the none of this view uh, is correct. And in fact, our uh, main point of the paper is to show that uh, there is no irreversibility comes from nowhere. In fact, there is no real irreversibility in the theorem. Now, given the Lenford theorem is a rigorous version of Boltzmann's uh, original argument, and in Boltzmann's original argument, the culprit for the emergence of irreversibility was the Stolzer and Satz. Perhaps we can, along the lines of what Lenfo suggests, diagnose the emergence of irreversibility exactly in the factorization condition, which is analogous to the Stolzer and Satz. 
However, the factorization condition, uh, which introduces a condition of non-correlation between the par particles, cannot be a source of irreversibility. In fact, remember that in Lenford's result, uh, we don't need factorization. We can derive the Boltzmann hierarchy, which is already reversible from the BBJKY hierarchy, uh, even before introducing the factorization condition. The factorization condition is introduced only at a subsequent step, the one that enables one to obtain the Boltzmann equation. So it can possibly be the source of irreversibility. Moreover, this expression is manifestly time reversal invariant, as we show also in the paper. And so uh, the uh, factorization condition cannot be uh, the time irreversible ingredient responsible for the irreversibility of the Boltzmann equation. But perhaps it is the adoption of the incoming representation uh, that introduces the time asymmetry, uh, just as the pre-collision condition in um, Boltzmann's original Stolz and Satz. And uh, Lenford's suggestion goes exactly along these lines. He says, we obtain the BBJKY hierarchy for the R spheres model by systematically writing collision phase points in their incoming representations. We could have equally have written them in the Algon representations. And uh, if we then assume factorization, we would have obtained the collision, the Boltzmann collision term with its sign reversed, the anti Boltzmann equation. It is thus essential in order to get the Boltzmann equation to assume this factorization condition for incoming collision points and not for outgoing ones. Now, it is true that if we write the BBJKY collision operator in the outgoing representation, we obtain this expression, which is different than the BBJKY operator in the incoming representation in the sense that the order of these two terms written in red here in the difference is reversed is flipped. And then if we take the Boltzmann graph limit, we obtain the negative of the collision operator in the Boltzmann hierarchy. In fact, we obtain the anti-Boltzmann hierarchy. And then uh, uh, if we apply the factorization condition, we derive the anti-Boltzmann equation for which the minus H function decreases. So formally, Lenfos claim is correct. However, it doesn't indicate the real source of irreversibility uh, because according to him, the preference for the incoming representation of, uh, of collision over the outgoing representation is just a matter of convention. So we choose the incoming representation if we want to derive the Boltzmann uh, equation and we choose the Algon representation if you want to derive the anti-Boltzmann equation. Nevertheless, the fact that we have an increase rather than a decrease of uh, uh, entropy is a substantive physical issue. And it's what assures, what guarantees agreement with our macroscopic observation. So it cannot be just a consequence of our conventional choice. How we decide to prove the theorem depends on our convention, but that we obtain an increase rather than increase of entropy cannot be a matter of uh, convention. It's a physical fact that needs a deeper underpinning than just a mere convention. And on this criticism on Lenfor, uh, Cercignani, Ilner, and Pulverenti agreed. And yes, the quote where they propose their own alternative solution, and I will try to read it given that there are um, 
compatriots of mine just by mocking an Italian accent. So we are compelled to ask whether the representation in terms of in going configurations or in coming configuration is the right one, i.e. physically meaningful. That is, it cannot be just a matter of convention. As we shall see later in a more careful analysis of the validity of the problem, the representation in terms of in going configurations follows automatically for our sphere's dynamics and is indeed not a matter of an a priori choice. So uh, they correctly emphasize that for Lenfors results to be empirically correct, the choice of the incoming representation must be independently justified. And they claim that this justification comes from the hard spheres dynamics. Um, however, and here's our uh, uh, objection to Cercignani in Repulgurenti, which we backed with a technical result, the identification of the incoming and the outgoing representation for collision point, which remember was introduced in order to assure the continuity of the dynamic itself. If we don't identify pre-collision and post-collision points, the dynamic is not smooth, is discontinuous. Uh, well, it is exactly this fact that undermines the idea proposed by Cercignani and friends that choosing one representation over the other will make any difference for the issue of physical reversibility. In fact, uh, notice that the topological identification of the pre-collision configuration X pre and the post-collision configuration X post does not mean at all that the two points are physically the same. In fact, they're two completely different points from a physical point of view. In the in X pre, we got incoming momenta. In X post, we have outgoing momenta, and they have, in general, very different values. In fact, these are two very different points from a physical point of view. Uh, actually, a weaker condition that the topological identification of the two points can be put in place. Uh, in order to uh, assure the smoothness of the dynamics. And it's a collision, uh, it's a condition introduced by Spong called continuity at collision, um, which requires that if we're dealing uh, with, or if we sit in the uh, pre collision points hemisphere, then it is sufficient in order to guarantee the smoothness of the dynamics that the distribution function computed at the incoming, uh, at the pre-collision point is equal to the distribution function uh, computed at the post-collision point. This is actually weaker than demanding that the arguments of the distribution functions are the same. They can be different, the important point is that, or the important thing is that the, the two distributions are the same. And if we invoke this uh, condition, if, which is weaker than the topological identification of pre-collision and post-collision point, then the dynamics is smooth. But if we um, invoke this condition, and here's our technical proposition, uh, then uh, uh, the uh, BBJK hierarchy in the incoming representation or even in the outgoing representation turns out to be time reversal invariant. Okay? In fact, the BBJK, what we proved is that the BBJK hierarchy in the outgoing representation is the time reversal transformation of the BBJKY hierarchy in incoming representation or vice versa. And that's not actually that surprising. But what's surprising is that the BBJKY hierarchy in the incoming representation is actually equal to the BBJKY hierarchy in the outgoing representation. So they're exactly the same. It doesn't really matter whether we invoke 
the incoming representation, we, we write the BBJKY hierarchy in the incoming representation or in the outgoing representation. Um, so the upshot of our proposition is that the source of irreversibility cannot be really lie in the choice of one representation, collision representation over the other. Okay? Um, continuity of collisions, in fact, guarantees the time reversal invariance of the BBJKY hierarchy. Um, and the choice of one representation over the other doesn't even make, that doesn't really make a difference on whether we want to derive the Boltzmann equation and the anti-Boltzmann equation, because there, uh, we can simply transform one incoming representation into the other because they're probably equivalent. It, in other words, there is not the right collision representation. Now the last proposal on the table is uh, a proposal that maintains that the irreversibility in the first theorem comes from the initial conditions. Uh, and this proposal was put forward by Spong and Lebovich. They point out that the domain of convergence, uh, that I remember is this sigma s, uh, comprising points for which particles have not yet collided in a given time span uh, is not invariant under time reversal transformation. And so Spong and Lebovich claim, ha, this must be the culprit for the emergence of irreversibility. However, if we set S equal to zero, and so we had the largest possible domain of convergence. And that's exactly actually the, the domain of convergence, which is used by Lenford in, in his original derivation. Um, then uh, sigma zero is clearly time reversal invariant. Uh, and then so also assumption two is time reversal invariant, okay? Uh, and therefore, we can't really blame this assumption to be time reversal non invariant, to be the culprit for the emergence of irreversibility. And here it comes our, I mean, I'm towards the end of the talk. Sorry if I was a bit longer, but I think the mathematical uh, subtleties needed to be explained in order to understand the conceptual point. Now, as we claim in the paper, uh, all these proposals uh, on the emergence of irreversibility fail to recognize the true status of irreversibility in Lenford's result. Irreversibility doesn't come from the choice of the, of the incoming of uh, uh, the ongoing collision representation. It doesn't come from the initial condition either. Okay? This proposal fail to identify any time asymmetric ingredient. And the reason is that actually there is no time asymmetric ingredient at all in Lenford theorem. The old theorem turns out to be time reversal invariant. Uh, and in order to appreciate this point, notice that both Lenford and subsequently Lebovich presented a version of the theorem that holds for negative times. They kept the regularity assumption fixed, uh, and then they require convergence over, uh, so that's the assumption number two, convergence of the initial uh, row to the, in, the initial solution, the BBJKY hierarchy to the initial solution of the Boltzmann hierarchy over, uh, gamma minus s, thereby deriving the anti-Boltzmann equation for all t from minus tau to zero. Okay? And of course, in this case, we obtain a monotonic decrease of uh, the h function. And this shows that the theorem has a very time reversal invariant form. And here it is. If we plot the trajectory of the minus h function 
it decreases for negative time while it increases for positive time, exactly in a very symmetric way. So the theorem itself is time reversal invariant. And there are no time uh, irreversible ingredient built into the assumptions of the theorem at all. Uh, but this poses a problem for Lenfos theorem itself, and that's the conclusive slide. Since entropy decreases monotonically in the past, it seems that the gas should tend to evolve far from equilibrium for negative times. And this is actually in fact contradiction with other microscopic observation. We expect uh, the gas evolving towards equilibrium in the future to come from even for a state which is even further away from equilibrium. So if a gas is freely expanding inside the vessel for a positive time, then we would expect that any time before the origin, the gas was even more contracted within a portion of the available space, a portion of the vessel. Uh, the more so because, of course, the choice of the initial time t equal to zero is fully arbitrary. So, you know, you can sit here, if you sit here, for instance, and you put the origin in this point here, then the theorem would tell us that, you know, entropy would be, would have this uh, plot for negative, for the new negative time. Uh, so, Lenford theorem, in conclusion, is time reversal invariant. There is no time asymmetric ingredient built into Lenford's assumption at all. But because it is type, time reversal invariant, it yields the wrong retrodictions. So, while it works, pretty well for the future, and it is a very powerful result, no doubts about that, it seems to fail for the past. And this, in our view, is the main limitation of the theorem. Great. Thanks, I'm done. Thank you. I think there were various uh, questions in chat uh, because I see the the you know yeah so actually but I didn't I didn't I didn't pay attention. Uh, don't to worry, uh, it's actually that uh, some people had to leave. So uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I I went very long, but you know that, uh, that's all right. That's all right. I, th I thought you know mm, it's a different. We we'll have we we'll have also coffee. next week, so hopefully <laughs> yeah. we we'll have time and we can also meet another time too i mean yeah you know. thanks thanks and thanks. i and i should say i mean next week um unfortunately on friday i have a meeting for the phd program at the polytechnic that i'm creating and so I i'm afraid i won't be able to to participate but uh that's all right we, we will arrange something maybe in the in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming sure. week if you guys want so okay uh take questions uh, we have uh, more than half an hour so Dustin, you, I see your end. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for the talk and the good explanations. Um, I, I think if I understand correctly, I agree with what you say in the end, but um, I thought it was understood basically since, since uh, Boltzmann that, um, I mean, what breaks time uh, symmetry is, is the assumption of a, low entropy initial distribution at time t0 and then the entropy will typically increase towards the future and towards the past yeah and then the whole problem with retrodictions leads to the you know the entire discussion with the past hypothesis uh, and so on so this all seems right it just seems you know i don't want to say trivial because it's not trivial but it's it's well known i would think yeah no, I agree. I agree. The problem is that, um, uh, okay, so the old past hypothesis uh, and that discussion has to do with the initial state of the universe. We know that we have very few proofs, uh, mathematical proofs about the old universe. Okay, so here we have a theorem and that's the power of Lenfos theorem. 
that is mathematically exact and uh, supposedly describes the behavior of a well-defined system, so uh, uh, like a gas. Uh, and uh, um, you know, it's a theorem that, and so we thought that uh, an important question was, you know, first of all, how do we understand conceptually this theorem, its importance? And we bump into a huge and mathematically very sophisticated discussion on the status of the theorem. And it took to us a while to, to understand, uh, um, you know, to understand uh, what was going on and what, were the, what we think are the mistakes in the, in the, um, in the, in these discussions. And then uh, we could, in the paper, provide a formal argument why this situation happens. And as far as I could tell, most of the discussions of the past hypothesis and all these problems uh, around the retrodictions are um, sort of informal. And uh, here instead, we, I think we could make it mathematically uh, precise. And uh, sure enough, this problem of round retrodiction was known already with respect to Boltzmann, but uh, as, you know, um, Carlo Rovelli's initial question, the first question he asked me about the stolz allen satz being valid only for pre-collision particles, uh, it was also well known that, you know, for Boltzmann, Boltzmann's original argument that was the culprit. And so it somewhat surprises, I think, surprising, I think, that in Lenfors theorem, which is a um, rigorous version of Boltzmann's original argument, we don't have the same fact. So it's not the stolz allen satz so the analog of the stolz allen satz that introduces uh, irreversibility. And I think this, this is, and I find this being this sort of far from trivial. <laughs> But then the consequence is that we have this picture. And as you say, maybe this is not surprising, but the um, sort of uh, interesting part is that we could make it precise, at least within um, well-defined mathematical conditions. So I, I, I don't know if I answer your questions or if I disappoint. Yeah, yeah, no, I just don't. Uh, don't agree that it's really different uh, from the situation in Boltzmann, um, because okay. in the end, if you one wants to always, if one wants to show propagation of molecular chaos or something, um, it's always for typical initial conditions with respect to the distribution at t equals zero. So it's always right. the situation that one has the special and in general low entropy boundary condition at t equals zero. And I think it's the same that's also behind the same origin of a symmetry that's also behind Boltzmann's argument. Uh, but maybe that's a different discussion. I, I, well, yeah, but I thought, okay, so it, the, it, you are right that we can uh, obtain this very same picture with uh, where by we're in you know uh, entropy the minus h function decreases on the left and increases on the right uh, but in Boltzmann's original argument here on the left you need to assume the stolz allen satz for post collisions uh, and you need to motivate why uh, particles should be uncorrelated after they collide. Whereas on the right, uh, you assume the original stolz allen satz for pre-collisions. The difference in Lenford theorem, and I think that's the content of our own theorem, is that it doesn't really matter whether, I mean, the, assuming the incoming representation, the incoming collision representation, or the outgoing collision representation, is perfectly equivalent. And so that enforces the intuition that the theorem is time reversal invariant. So whereas in Boltzmann's original argument, choosing pre rather than post collision makes a huge difference. In Lenfor, it doesn't, or at least that's what we believe we proved with this uh, proposition, which we have in the paper.
Yeah, I mean, it's certainly very valuable to see exactly how um, how this comes out in in Lenford's theorem. In in my opinion, um, in in Boltzmann's argument, it's it's ultimately the same. The, the okay. symmetry comes from the fact that you know independence is assumed at t equals zero, essentially. Yeah. So it always okay. comes from distinguishing the special boundary condition, so to speak. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. You should, should I understand. Not, even even Boltzmann's original heuristic argument really depended on uh, uh, special, very special initial conditions. That's true, and um, that's yeah. certainly correct. Yeah. No, but but thank you. We that that doesn't seem to be mo that much of a disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. No, but it's good to talk about that. I mean, these are. Mm subtle and controversial matters so it's always important to yeah to have a, thank you a discussion thank you uh so the next ones uh, on the list are aurelian then philip and then uh, rob so next is aurelian so i hope my son's okay so yes uh, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, interesting talk uh, very technical as well but <laughs> I try, uh, the, the point is, um, I think I agree with you concerning the, the symmetry between ingoing and outgoing representation because it looks like a, a natural problem that you have already also in, a, in field theory when you want to mm -hmm. describe a, a scattering process in terms of initial condition of, of final conditions, like the green function is retarded the advance. But um, the, 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 the point that I don't maybe I don't understand is you say that the factorization uh, condition that is on hypothesis that you, you that, that is used in the in the theorem is is, uh, is symmetric is time symmetrical I didn't really understand that because it seems to be really introducing for me a right right okay so remember uh, okay let me step back then um, Okay, so is the Boltzmann hierarchy, okay, yes. which turns out to be equivalent to the Boltzmann equation if we assume the factorization condition. So th this is the factorization condition in, in its generalized form. So the factorization condition is only needed in order to go from the Boltzmann hierarchy to the Boltzmann equation. But the Boltzmann hierarchy is time reversal non invariant, just as the Boltzmann equation. Okay. So the old theorem is about deriving the Boltzmann hierarchy from the BBJKY hierarchy. And the BBJKY hierarchy is equivalent to the uh, Hamiltonian equations of motion. And so it's time reversal invariant. So the theorem. Then for theorem, here it is, under the two as technical assumptions we saw, we can derive the, B, the Boltzmann hierarchy from the BBJKY hierarchy. So there's no mention of the Boltzmann equation yet here. You obtain the Boltzmann equation as, at a subsequent step, namely when you uh, adopt the factorization condition. So the theorem shows you that you go from the BBJKY hierarchy, a time reversal invariant uh, hierarchy of equations, to the Boltzmann hierarchy, a time reversal non invariant uh, sequence of equations. But so it is valid at one time, it cannot be valid at another time. So you. Sorry? If, if this is valid at, uh, this, at say, let's say time t zero, it cannot be true at the at at subsequent time or the past time as well. So uh, no, the, at the subsequent time, at least uh, up to the positive time tau, yes, it is okay. true. I mean that's the content of the theorem, <laughs> and that's why even if tau is extremely small, mm -hmm. um, it's enough to show irreversibility. So that's the surprising fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, and but this reverse this time reversal non invariance is already uh, in the Boltzmann hierarchy. 
So when we move at the subsequent step by assuming factorization to the Boltzmann equation, we don't gain irreversibility, we already have it. Um, also, you see that, you know, uh, and then uh, we know also that this factorization condition holds at, if it holds at time zero, it holds continuously in time, which is, by the way, another difference with respect to Boltzmann's original argument, the Tolsal and Satz need to be assumed continuously, whereas here, and that's why it's called propagation or chaos, you assume it at the initial time and then it holds through time. Okay, that's a result of the kinetic theory of gases. But the only point that we were trying to make is that factorization itself does not introduce irreversibility. Irreversibility comes already before. Some, somewhere in the passage from the BBJKY hierarchy to the Boltzmann hierarchy. And also it is, I mean, this condition is manifestly time reversal uh, uh, invariant, you know, so uh, it has the, exactly the same form if we take minus t. Yeah, okay. That is basically but, short condition. Sorry? It's a very special condition anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, that. this is times okay. I just, this is a uh, yeah. okay. Okay. Sure. Well, thanks for the question. I mean, it's, okay. Philippe wrote a question uh, in the chat. I don't know, Philippe, if you want to elaborate or ask. Uh, well, a little bit. Uh, well, the question was. Uh, as, so you have a t equal zero. It's maybe related to the next question by Rob. Uh, cannot you show that uh, your calculation is only valid for positive t's and that it's meaningless for negative t's? So then you would be sort of happy. Uh, I, I'm thinking to something else, which is, for instance, the quantum regression theorem in quantum optics. You, you have a time ordering, which, uh, but it's quantum, obviously, uh, whereas your, your calculation seems classical. Class, it's completely classical. The, the, this theorem and the, all the results we obtain uh, are classical, yes. In the quantum regression theorem, where we use, that you use to calculate correlation function in quantum optics, uh, there is a time ordering. That is, you, you have to, you get the result for positive time, then you can get for negative time, but actually it's a different calculation. Uh, okay. So, so I was wondering whether you would have something like that, that is, you, you have sort of a hidden or maybe sort of an... Uh, uh, my, you mean which makes it valid only for positive time? Uh, well, so. uh, um, actually, I think you know. Um, uh, I have to think more about the possible analogy, this analogy with the quantum case. That's, I think, a, an, an interesting question. Um, Certainly, what makes, let's see, uh, what makes the, um, you see, uh, Lenfor and Lebovich proved a version of Lenfor's theorem also for the past. Uh, now, all they did was to change the domain of convergence. Uh, and so perhaps that's what uh, makes the, trajectory of the, um, no, that, that's what probably what made them uh, able to derive the anti-Boltzmann equation and so the trajectory, the plot of the minus if H function as this. Um, if, yeah. if you change the hypothesis from positive to negative time, uh, well, it's not the same calculation, then uh, you have just have to remove the negative time because you, it, mm -hmm. it's, within the hypothesis which allows you to calculate the positive time. In, in the quantum, for the quantum regression theorem, it's related to preservation of commutation relation, etc. But uh, you have to choose. You, you cannot get both at the same time. You can, you can get any of them, but not both at the same time. I see, I see. Uh, probably it's true here too. I mean, you... Um, 
you can only have the theorem going in one direction. In fact, if you apply it in the other direction, you need to change uh, yes, something. It, 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 uh, you need to change exactly the second assumption, the convergence at time zero, by requiring that it, it holds within a different domain of convergence. Uh, okay, but then it, it just means that what I say, that is negative time is meaningless unless you, you consider other hypotheses. Yeah. Uh, but that's, a, I mean, I think it's in line with the conclusion that we draw, then, uh, then uh, but, but so you, the theorem doesn't really work well for the past. Yes, but this provides a reason for that, that this past is not allowed by the calculation. Uh, it's not allowed by the calculation that you use for the future, that's correct. But you can apply a version of the theorem for the past, it just has to be, uh, you have to change something, of course, yeah. yeah. Then you have to, to, to two different curves. It's yeah, two. I think so, yeah, I, I, two different theorems, and yeah, that's true. And, they, and, they, and that's true for every point, for every instant of time that you choose as the origin. That's mm -hmm. also the weird part about Benford. Yes, yes for, for, for quantum regression, it's the same, that is, you can choose okay. your, not, but it's not a symmetric with zero, whatever zero you choose, you, you, it's not the same calculation. I so see. If you split the calculation in two different parts, I would say that it's, it's fine because you, you, you show that the entropy increases the, to the future, and, but this doesn't tell you anything about the past. Unless that's true, that's true, but I, I, that, that's correct. But I think, you know, it adds a complication uh, because, okay, so suppose you apply the theorem here at, at this time zero, mm -hmm. okay? You let the system evolve here. And then uh, when you're here in this point, uh, you apply the theorem again. Uh, and so you just backwards. So you expect that uh, the plot for the minus H function should go back uh, yeah, no, you actually, but it does not. It, go, it goes up, so you get. Goes up, but be, because you 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 use a theorem out of its validity range, I think it's related to Rob's question. How do you define t equals zero? Uh, if uh, you and me choose different t equals zero, we will get different increase or decrease of entropy, which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no, but, but I think you know. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen that question by Rob. Maybe you. you did you write yeah, I was going to ask it next, but uh, it makes a good switch into. Uh, so it was just, yeah. But I, okay, so but I was just, sure. let me just repeat it for those who didn't see it in the chat. So I was saying, if, if you and me choose two different zeros for our time, what is zero for you might be different from what is zero for me. How, will, how do we agree about what's happening physically? Or, or is there some physical mechanism by which we can all agree this time is T zero? No, I think no. I think we can even disagree. And that's, uh, and, that's, uh, and that's the problem. As I said, mm. you see, um, maybe I went too fast in my criticism of them for, and I think, you know, what you pointed out, both pointing out is exactly the point I wrote here. Uh, you know, the choice of the initial time is arbitrary. So maybe you and I can have a different uh, um, initial instance and we might get different results which is of course um, weird uh, because you expect I mean you want the theorem to be able to tell you how things go uh, exactly in, in a, in a intersubjective way uh, but it does not um, I don't fully agree it, it always okay. tells if you choose a given instant, then from that, the entropy will increase. And then this is a generic conclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will increase, uh, but I thought, but it might increase in the, I mean, we might have different uh, arguments of the minus H function, so different uh, FT. So it's true that we it should, uh, when it doesn't matter what the initial time is, if we apply the theorem properly, it will give us increase of entropy. And so we all agree on that. We might disagree on uh, FT. I thought it was, this was the question by Rob. I, I, maybe I should read it in the, 
if uh, the question probably wasn't very well posed so <laughs> okay okay <laughs> no, no, but, uh, so we will uh, okay i think we will agree that the entropy increases in the future we might have however different values for uh, for uh, uh, our evolved distribution function exactly because the initial distribution function is different if it is chosen at different instance so in that sense we might disagree but as a qualitative behavior of entropy, uh, I think we should agree uh, if we look at the future. Yes, and for instance, if my time is uh, after your time, I'm not allowed to conclude that uh, between your time and my time, the entropy was going the wrong way because yeah. it's an application of the theorem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, unless we apply the theorem backwards, of course, and then uh, you will think that the system is coming from a state of higher entropy if, you, if you're at a later time, and I will think the opposite. And so, so in other words, the, the contradiction could be if we sit in different points of uh, mm -hmm. time. Yes, but if you add the condition that it's only valid for positive time, then we are fine. Yeah, yeah, then, then yes. Yeah, then we agree that it will, uh, the entropy will increase, yes. Is that? Uh, okay, so by, by the way, Giovanni, the, don't worry, the, the question uh, written in the chat by Rob was almost exactly as... Uh, okay, okay, because I'm not looking at the chat really. I'm not hiding anything. Uh, <laughs> but there is another question in the chat from Rafael, uh, which again, uh, we... Rafael, if you want, you can ask directly. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for the talk, it was really, really interesting. So yeah, I was just thinking that uh, all this uh, reasoning by Lensford is classical and it looks like it does not manage to account for the asymmetry. So uh, I don't know, maybe uh, is, is this a hint uh, to th that uh, the, we, would, uh, we could explain the asymmetry only by a, a quantum approach and not a classical one? Or do you see uh, any chance to okay, so work on for the asymmetry with a, a classical reasoning? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, so my instinct is always to go for the deeper theorem, the, the deeper theory. So I would expect um, quantum stuff to be more fundamental and so to give us a proper answer. And of course, I'm pleased to see that uh, you know, even if we have something like the CPT theorem in quantum field theory, then uh, um, there seem to be phenomena that are even at the microscopic level that display a, a time symmetry, as we know. Um, uh, but there is also, independently of what is exactly the level uh, uh, at, of the physical level from which we need to the explanation for what's going on at the microscopic level, there still remain a question, even if we stick to the classical level, how do we make our descriptions compatible? Because, um, you know, we observe irreversibility at the microscopic level, uh, and we can, you know, uh, still uh, like a gas expanding, and we can still look at the gas as being composed by classical molecules. And so it must be possible even at that level to recover what's going on at the microscopic level, and even if it isn't the most fundamental level, even if the quantum level is more fundamental, we still can think of, the, uh, of a gas as being composed by classical elements. And so it's a question interested, interesting in its own to, uh, you know, how do we um, establish the compatibility between, you know, uh, thermodynamics and classical statistical mechanics. Um, but the fact that 
one of the most powerful theorems that we have for the description of uh, um, the behavior of a gas, namely Lenfos theorem, at the classical level doesn't give us the correct answer, could be a sign that we need to go, you know, far deeper. So maybe the quantum uh, an analysis of what's going on at the quantum level will be uh, more. Sorry, Francisca isn't, doesn't, doesn't agree. <laughs> I, I, I tend to think no. Ah, uh, <laughs> <so> Francesca. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I tend to think that, uh, I mean, as long as you consider mechanical system, whether they are classical or quantum mechanical system, you would not see reversibility. But yeah, let's. Yeah, yeah, it, it's of it's course a pending question. And, uh, you know, it's. There's an ongo and there are ongoing discussions on that, and I'm, I, I guess they will continue linearly in time, you know, to increase probably. <laughs> but um, okay, thank you. thank you. Okay, I still have uh, three questions, and we don't have much time, so I'm going to ask to make uh, both questions and answer uh, as quick as you can. So the next one I have is Jan. Okay, so let me just make a comment. Uh, people have said that you don't account for irreversibility. Now, there are many papers that describe the qualitative solution of Boltzmann, of which a rigorous version is given by Lanford's theorem. And uh, there are participants here like Dustin and Paula who think she's gone, but, and of course, Dibovitz, Goldstein, and many other mm -hmm. people have written about that. And if you take, for example, the gas expanding in the box, then indeed, if it's expanded halfway, let's say, then if you were to suppose to know only that, and you were to predict the the, the future of the of the gas, you would have to say that it comes from a fluctuation, and it comes from a fluctuation from an equilibrium situation. While we know, because we know that the system was not isolated, that it started from being from in a small part of the box, in one half of the box. So it's let's say expanded, let's say three quarter, one quarter, not completely one half, one half. But, you know, at that time, if you want to predict, if you not only that want to predict the future, you will predict that it comes from an equilibrium situation, which is wrong. And we all know that. But the easy problem about, uh, easy, I mean, it's not easy, the Lanford theorem, but easy problem is to explain why if you start from a, a low entropy uh, situation, then you will evolve towards a high entropy one. The hard question is, where does the low entropy thing come from? Of course, if you take the gas in the box, we all know where it comes from. It's just because somebody pushed the gas in a piston. It was not isolated. But then, of course, you have to ask, where does the person come from? And then you have to go to a long song and dance about food, about uh, you know the sun uh, sending us low entropy photons, and where does the sun come from? Eventually, you go back to the origin of the universe, and that's what we call the hard question. Okay. Yeah. But I think that the result, the conclusion of your talk, and of your talk is, and your talk was very clear. And the conclusion is completely uh, correct, but it's also completely in harmony with, as Dustin said, with Boltzmann I, original ideas. I mean, Boltzmann asked, "Let's start with the low entropy state and let's see what it does in the future." How do we come to the low entropy state? That we don't know. Yeah. So, the, the t equals zero, well, you can take another t equals zero, but nevertheless, you have to always assume that you start from low entropy state and you ask what's going on in the future. And that's what we observe in the real world. What we don't observe or don't find harder to explain is where does the low entropy start from? But you see, I think to me, okay, anyway, that's my remark. I mean, that because people have, I mean, it has nothing to do with quantum mechanics and people have said, you know, uh, that Lanford theorem does not account for irreversibility. In my view, it does, as far as the easy quote, um, <laughs> easy problem <laughs> is. And, but it doesn't solve the harm problem. It doesn't solve that problem, that's, that, that's correct. That's all, but that's all. But otherwise, it does solve the easy problem. It's not so easy. But you take, take for example, a simpler model, like, uh, uh, you know, the, the cat string model. There, everything is clear, everything can be proven, everything. It's artificial, but other than that, it has all the properties and you have a Boltzmann equation, you can derive Boltzmann equation, you can see exactly what's going on and how it's probabilistic, etc., etc. and you reverse the velocities, then you're going to go back to the initial state. 
but you have to make an assumption, a probabilistic assumption, that works in the vast majority of cases. Mm -hmm. If and given you know some ordered situation where all the balls are white and they become more or less mixed, black and white, but you you have to make an assumption on the distribution of the obstacles or the crosses. And if you make that assumption, of course, if you reverse the velocities, then that assumption is no longer true. Okay, that's that's yeah. all. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you. I mean, and of course, even uh, it's of course very hard to justify uh, and explain why the universe should be in a lower state, and it's even hard to say what is the state, how do we define the state of the universe, and how we define its uh, its entropy. Um, and so, it's certainly a very hard question that too. I mean, I didn't. Uh, yeah. I did. I didn't mean any. I think I didn't say in any part of the talk that the uh, beside lamp four and its small domain of application or what we have done in the paper. Uh, it's so easy. Quite the opposite. But I think, uh, um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, what 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 you are mentioning uh, now and what you're stressing is, I think, in harmony with the uh, with the point that Yoss and I made in the paper uh, and in this, but we, you know, um, uh, we were interested in understanding where exactly in irreversibility come from uh, in Lanford's theorem. Mm -hmm. And uh, all our analysis, which was a conceptual and mathematical for the most, showed that there is no uh, time asymmetric ingredient. I mean, we never, try to explain, to answer Except, the big question. Well, the so we were focusing the, on... Uh, the irreversibility is that you make assumption on initial condition, that's all. Uh, not really, uh, because the initial... Because condition, if, you take, if you take the picture which is there on the screen, at time zero, you make something, there's something special. The time, the intro, entropy increases in the future and not in the past, and that's exactly why i mean that's because of the assumption it's by definition made at time zero the time zero could be another time that's true and if you make the assumption at that time then you get that result anyway uh, yeah 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 but how do we uh, how do we um uh, derive a result that tells us that the entropy increases at least uh, in the framework of lamford that was the big question uh and uh, um uh, I think quite differently from what happened in Boltzmann, and we know that in that case the source of irreversibility comes from the pre-collision component of the Stolzmann ansatz. Here in Lamford, uh, we don't have that, uh, an, uh, you know, analog, uh, analog result. Quite the opposite, because as we prove, uh, factorization conditions in itself is not time reversal invariant, and then. Assuming the incoming representation is exactly equivalent to uh, assuming the uh, outgoing representation. So there's a major difference with respect to Boltzmann. As I said, in, 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 in we, so in this paper, uh, we were interested in trying to understand uh, Lenfors theorem and uh, um, its status with respect to reversibility. And uh, as we sat and, and you know, work on the theorem and, you know, a lot of uh, sub mathematical subtleties need to be solved uh, that led us to different conclusions from, uh, from other authors. And um, that, that, that was our project here, nothing bigger than that, <laughs> I should say. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, again, we, we have just two, I hope, small uh, remark uh, from previous questions. So if you don't mind, Giovanni, staying just a couple of minutes more. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you for that. So Rob and Aurelien, uh, Rob, you're first. And again, uh, please try and be as quick as okay, possible. Okay, mine will be super quick because it was basically the same as the previous question. Uh, it was basically uh, just asking about how you think about a, I think, I think a lot of our intuition uh, about entropy changes is for open systems. 
And when you start applying it to your intuition to closed systems, it's easy to make a mistake. And I think somehow what you're saying is, is you know, when there's a closed system that makes a, that you leave for a million years, uh, so it shouldn't be infinite, but it should be reasonably large. You live for a million years, even though it's in equilibrium, there will be fluctuations. And after a million years, there might be a really big fluctuation just by randomness. Um, if you then film that fluctuation and what happens before and afterwards and watch that film, we believe that if you watch that film backwards, it will look exactly the same as if you watch that film forwards. So for that fluctuation, uh, as you go away from the fluctuation, the entropy will increase in both directions. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the thing is that we're always skewed by our intuition that comes from open systems where if there's if all the particles are in one corner of the box, it's because someone put them there, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. involves, there was work that was done, which involves entropy increasing somewhere else in the universe and all this stuff. And so somehow I think it's probably some of the issues related here are also issues related to our, our intuition being misled by being confused between open and closed systems. But I think Jean maybe said that better than I did. So I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, thanks, thanks for the, mm -hmm. for the remark. And I think, you know, um, that, that, that certainly, um, you know, um, it is true that part of our uh, way of interpreting what happens in uh, uh, closed systems is uh, um, uh, affected by what, you know, we know about open systems so the way in which we treat open systems and there's a risk of making confusion between the treatment of the two and uh, transporting consideration from one to the other and that can be uh, certainly a source of confusion for the confusion yeah uh Arilien? oh sorry yeah uh, i was thinking to <laughs> so the um... Uh, my, my question is simply a continu continuity of the, the of the same topic because uh, uh, all the uh, all these questions are, con uh, are connected to the to the same uh, same issue somehow. Uh, my my remark was uh, uh, what about the, 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 the collision process itself? Uh, the collision process itself is very much uh, idealization in your in your model because you, you use the hard sphere uh, collision mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, but in, re in reality, it's more like a scattering process where you have infinite time between. Uh, normally, when you are doing that in, in quantum mechanics, we imagine quantum wave, wave packet going from the infinite past, and uh, after, and then after you have separated pack, wave packet after another uh, infinite past as well, infinite future as well. So this is looking like a idealization when you can uh, describe scattering process, and uh, you you consider that. Uh, at the given time, you can identify uh, two representation. And, and if it is not the case, then the factorization hypothesis seems to be uh, a problem because you you break some of the, the time symmetry uh, by doing. Uh, yeah, I think you know, hypothesis. I, I agree. I think you know, and one of the yeah, we are okay. One of the. Um, our criticisms to Lenfors original uh, work or discussion of his work was exactly the identification between the pre-collision configuration, the post-collision configurations. These are two points in phase space that it takes to be one and the same, but they are physically very different. And so I think it is, you're correct in saying that uh, um, we should not identify them otherwise it's a it's a str too strong of an idealization luckily and here uh, we um, you know we need to thank spawn really uh, in order to guarantee continuity of the dynamics so that there isn't a jump in the trajectory in phase space it's enough to uh, appear to a weaker condition which is the continuity of collision so rather than identifying the pre-collision and the post-collision point, we can simply demand, we, we simply demand that uh, the distribution function 
takes on the same value at the two points. But this is not to say that the two points ought to be identified at all. In fact, they, they are different mathematically and physically. Uh, and so I think in this way, um, we can avoid introducing a very strong idealization, which is physically misleading, like the one that uh, Lamphos originally suggested, namely, you know, the identification between pre-collision and post-collision con configurations. Uh, I don't know if this goes along the line. Yeah, the model is very, so much idealized that at the end, uh, it breaks and the, the intuition of Boltzmann uh, that you, you start with the molecular chaos hypothesis where you have a not correlated system and at the end you have correlated systems. This is so it's somewhere it's hidden this hypothesis in the axiomatic here. And, uh, the, all the details I cannot say, but uh, it's right, right. It's something is, is breaking the definitely the time symmetry. Otherwise, you could not you, you could apply iteratively uh, the, the reasoning. But it's mm. when you, in your figure that you show where this uh, entropy uh, yeah, yeah. during one point uh, with a slope which is positive and one is negative, it really shows that uh, uh, it's valid only at one given time. It cannot be applied iteratively. And, uh, no, 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 I should not. Yeah. Um, so it's certainly connected to the idealization of the, the description of the collision because. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I should say there is even a stronger idealization, if you want. I mean, we're working with the Grad Boltzmann limit. So, and, uh, and as I mentioned in one of the slides about the limitations of Lenford theorem, that means that uh, at best the theorem can, is applicable to the case of very diluted gases mm -hmm. um, because the density of the gas goes to zero. Uh, but then also the particle's diameter goes to zero. And so what does it mean for two points to collide, you know, two point particle to collide? And so it's even, it's even you know, there, there, is even this, there, there is this extra uh, uh, complication conceptually. Um, um, I mean, if you look at the pre-collision point here as the post-collision point, as they've written here, uh, then if A, the diameter of the particles is zero, then the two particles sits, the center of the two particles sit in the same point. And so, you know, um, <laughs> what does it mean that the, these two point particles uh, interact by collisions in that case? So, so maybe uh, the model is simply too, too much, uh, is too, too, mathemati too mathematical and not uh, physical enough. Yeah, that's the, that's the price to pay. I mean, if you want to make Boltzmann's derivation, derivation precise and exact, as Lenford did, then you need to introduce a lot of assumptions that are, uh, that brings you far from the physics, I think, you know, and I mean, one of the, you know, the, the, our objectives in this paper was to analyze uh, those idealizations as, as well. Mm. Thank you, clarify a bit. Thank you. So let's thank again Giovanni for the. No, thank you all for the interesting questions and. <laughs> I still have to uh, with a uh, real ends, even though <laughs> it doesn't arrive. So thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop the recording.